Hello, welcome to the Social Science Space webinar, A Scientific Approach to Social Science Communication with Elizabeth Suhey, Aaron Nash, Emily Cloyd, and Aaron Heath. My name is Michael Todd, and I edit the website Social Science Space for Sage Publishing. Let's meet our panelists who conducted a research project on science communication and are the authors of the report, Recommended Practices for Science Communication with Policymakers. Political scientist Elizabeth Liz Suhey is an associate professor in the School of Public Affairs at American University. Her research centers on political behavior within the American context. Emily Cloyd is the director of the American Association for the Advancement of Science Center for Public Engagement with Science and Technology. She oversees all center programming, including the AAAS Leshner Leadership Institute and the Communicating Science Program. Also at AAAS, Erin Heath is an Associate Director of Government Relations. She co-chairs the Coalition for National Science Funding, the Engaging Scientists and Engineers in Policy Coalition, and is on the steering committee of the Golden Goose Award. Erin Nash works at the interface of social philosophy and the philosophy of science. She's currently on, on an honorary research fellow in the School of Humanities and Languages at the University of New South Wales, looking mainly at issues having to do with misinformation and the ethics of policy and communication, the uh, and politics of communication. And by the way, Erin joins us from Australia, where it is very early in the day, so a special thank you to her. Now, this one-hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing on social science space. We will be sending out a link to view it and access the slides and, all, uh, and to all registrants in the coming week. And if any of you have problems with the audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box, and it's likely on the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. And we'll be taking questions from the audience throughout the webinar, so please also use that Q&A box to ask any questions of our guests throughout the webinar, and we'll attempt to address them during our conversation. And please also take note of the webinar hashtag, hashtag SAGE, S-A-G-E, talks, T-A-L-K-S, and feel free to qu ask questions or leave comments there. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Liz to provide a quick overview of the Recommended Practices Project. Okay, uh, so thanks everyone for joining us and allowing us to share with you some tips for communicating with policymakers. Uh, before I dive in, I want to mention that we're grateful to the National Academy of Sciences and also the Rita Allen Foundation for sponsoring our research. And I also want to mention our website, uh, www.american.edu slash SPA slash SCICOM, where you can find more information about our research, including the guide that I'll be discussing today. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to the uh, to talk a little bit about the evidence behind our recommended practices. So uh, last year we completed the bulk of our research, and that research included reviewing hundreds of published studies on our topic across over a dozen different fields. Uh, we also conducted in-person interviews with over 20 members of Congress and 20 staff members, both Democrats and Republicans. We surveyed over 600 randomly selected scientist members of AAAS, and we conducted an in-depth case study of science communication and congressional hearings. Um, we have, as you might guess, a number of um, uh, more academic articles that, that are being um, uh, written up at the moment. And today we're gonna focus though on our recommended practices guide. So here we've synthesized what we've learned about effective and ethical communication into this, this short guide. Um, so moving on to the overview, the guide, you can see it's divided into six different sections. And again, if you wanna dig into the details, you can go over to our website and find both a PDF and a web-based version of the guide there. I'm gonna quickly walk you through these six sections, emphasizing just one or two key ideas from each section. And we're also gonna get into these um, different ideas in more detail later in the webinar. So we'll start with planning ahead. Um, this is, kind of a, a no-brainer, but um, academics, um, you know, are known for spending a lot of time on their studies and sometimes go into communicating about their research uh, without spending uh, enough, enough time and thinking about what they're going to say and who they're speaking with. I want to particularly emphasize here the importance of researching the person or the group with whom, with whom you'll be communicating, especially important in the policymaking arena we suggest that you consider the person's uh, professional responsibilities, think about their incentives, 
and also think about their likely knowledge level and then adjust your communication with these things in mind. Moving on to communication goals, this is probably the most important topic in our guide. It also can be summed up the most succinctly. So in short, know what you want to get out of any communication with a policymaker, make that plain in your interaction, and also consider what the policymaker might have to gain from the interaction. So moving on to communication content and continuing on, on the earlier theme, your communication should include an answer to the why should I care question. So why should a busy policymaker take time and resources to act on your request or suggestion? Note that convincing a policymaker they should care includes some sophisticated thinking um, about their professional goals, about constraints that they may face, as well as some easier tasks like just making sure your communication is non-technical and can be understood by a layperson. Uh, so the next point is the more social aspect of communicating in this arena. Um, this is something that in our experience is often overlooked by academics in particular, how social and networked the policymaking arena is. So your credentials certainly matter, but it also matters quite a bit, frankly, who you know in many circumstances. That's the kind of thing that builds trust. So you're, you're more likely to be more impactful over time if you foster relationships with elected officials, staff members, and others in the policymaking arena. Um, so next we have um, the elephant or perhaps the donkey in the room, which is communicating in a political context. This is a complicated subject. Um, too complicated to easily boil down here, but uh, we do wanna say that our general perspective is that the US political system is designed so that policy outcomes aggregate many inputs. This includes technical advice, um, but it also includes things like citizens' value priorities. So if you're going to wade into the policymaking arena, it's important to have patience with the messiness of democratic politics and also respect for diverse viewpoints. This said, we also wanna acknowledge that there are many problematic influences on policy outcomes. Voices that knowingly misrepresent evidence are particularly troublesome. And in fact, this is a big part of the reason why we wrote this guide in the first place is to encourage more nonpartisan experts to communicate with policymakers. So finally, some practicalities when communicating with policymakers. Again, uh, probably too much to boil down here, but our, our general point is to recommend learning various on the ground details of the policymaking body you plan to interact with, including easily overlooked but really crucial details such as legislative timetables, or even simply knowing when people are likely to be in the office taking meetings. There's a lot to know. Um, much of this can ease your way into a, a policymaking body and, and make it easier to, to gain access. Um, and on the one hand, you know, you can learn some of these things before you dive in. On the other, I would say from our own experiences that many of these details we absorbed along the way as we actually went about uh, engaging with policymakers through our own research. Um, so finally, um, I wanted to point out that we do have a one pager that we prepared. This is on our website. You can also see it here, just an overview of the different sections, uh, different points in our in our booklet. And um, so we have this summary for you here, and we are also actualizing here our own advice, which is that one of the things we learned through our research is it's important to have a one-pager, a one especially when you go to Capitol Hill, um, so that people can easily um, take in your, your main points and you have something to leave behind that people can remember you by. And with that, I will turn things over to Michael. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, let's talk about the challenges, the processes, and the payoffs of connecting research with policymakers for the, the next 15 minutes or so. And audience members, please send your questions in using the question box, which is, again, most likely on the right side of your screen, or via Twitter using hashtag stage talks. So my first question is, Liz, there's been a lot of research carried out recently on how best to communicate with about science with the public. And your project is different and it focuses with science communication with policymakers. How does SciComm with policymakers differ from SciComm with the public? And maybe we could get the other panelists to uh, um, kind of show themselves too at this point and we get the conversation going. 
<laughs> Thanks. Yeah, this is definitely a group effort. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons we actually undertook this research is because there had been much more research on SCICOM with the public than SCICOM with policymakers, at least in the U.S. arena. Um, and you know what we discovered along the way is that there are there definitely are some similarities and there are some differences. So some similarities between um, SICOM with the public and SICOM with policymakers include the fact that you know policymakers they are often generalists and so you have to prepare your communication um, you know for basically a lay audience using non-technical language. Um, may be surprising to hear, but policymakers are human beings, meaning that they are uh, likely to have their attention captured by compelling narratives and uh, interesting examples. And, um, you know, if you're conveying statistical information, you know, recommended practice is that you do so through figures uh, as opposed to um, a bunch of messy tables. So those are some similarities, but there definitely are some differences and I would emphasize three key differences. One is that um, the public often engages with science out of curiosity, maybe a hobby, um, maybe some activism. They're often drawn to a range of topics and they're often interested in more academic presentations. However, policymakers are more goal and policy driven, so they're going to be often engaging because they have a strong need uh, for policy relevant information, or they expect you to tell them why a particular topic is important to their constituents or their legislative agenda. So the second point I'd raise about differences is that um, policymakers, especially at the federal level, do not have a lot of time. Um, if you're meeting with an elected official, you know, you'll be lucky if you get a half hour. So it's really important to be really efficient when you communicate. And the third difference I'd highlight is that, um, at least, uh, well, in our, in our view, all else equal, the stakes really are quite high when you're talking with policymakers. I mean, they, they may translate your advice into policy that affects an awful lot of people. So I'd say there's a greater responsibility to communicate clearly and accurately. Um, and I, you know, I'd also say that there's um, uh, more onus on the science communicator to make sure they listen to the person they're communicating with to make sure that they're being understood and also that they're providing relevant information. So those are kind of the, the highlights there. I'm going to continue with another question, but I, I do want to say that if as other panelists want to weigh in on some of this, by, by all means do. But I do have a specific question for Emily. And then you and Liz worked together on a survey of scientists about their communication practices. So how much are scientists engaging with policymakers, and what does that engagement look like? Yeah, so we found that more than half of the scientists who responded, about 55%, had communicated with a policymaker in the last two years before the survey. And that most of those, uh, about 89%, said that they plan to continue engaging with policymakers. In terms of who they're engaging with, uh, most popular are their national level elected officials, so Congress people, um, also their state level elected officials. After that, uh, the staff of those policymakers and also government agency staff. So those who are working at federal or state agencies. Um, and then what are they actually doing? Uh, the most popular form of engagement is email. I think that's probably true for most communication these days. Uh, and then followed by in-person meetings and phone calls. Uh, we also asked the scientists what their goals were when they were engaging with these policymakers. Uh, the most frequently cited were drawing attention to a particular problem or advocating for the use of science and also arguing for a particular policy option. So a, a quick follow-up from uh, from the audience and I'm just wondering they're wondering is it given that we're in the countdown in the U.S. to the 2020 elections is it useful to provide information during a campaign event or is it better to set an appointment with policymaker or staff and, and uh, that's divorced from campaigning. That's a, that's a great question. D Emily, did you want to weigh in or I, I can follow up? I think uh, Liz can certainly chime in here too, but the um, 
there, there's a lot of sort of cycles of how policy happens when policymakers might be busy or not busy. Um, making sure that you're trying to set appointments when they will actually be in the place you are trying to meet with them. So knowing if there is a break coming up where they might be going back to their home district, you may actually be able to meet with them in that home district rather than coming to Washington, D.C. if it's a national level policymaker. If you're working with staff, you may actually find that a better time to meet with them because they might be a little bit more relaxed. Yeah, so I... I would um, echo those those points. I, I think, you know, it's tricky at a campaign event if you're actually talking with the person who's running for election. I mean, they're going to be awfully distracted at that moment in time. And one thing we learned in our research was it's hard to get um, policymakers to to do too much um, when they are engaged in a competitive um, election. But um, I do think that if you give voice to some concern at that point, um, I think it at least could get that on that person's radar screen because they are, at, you know, very much being attentive to public opinion at that point. But I think for a more imp impactful interaction at that point in time, you might um, you might use the campaign events as a way of connecting. You know, you can speak with the the official, but you might use it as a way of connecting with a staffer, and then trying to get a staffer's a, a staffer's time. I would say. Um, so echo, echoing what what Emily said there. Well, let's move a little bit from the um, specific, which that was, and kind of generalize a little bit more. And this is also I'm, I'm going to ask Emily. First, what did scientists think was most effective when communicating with policymakers? And in other words, were there things they thought that made their communications less effective? Let's kind of look at the, the uh, backside of that coin. Yeah, I think there were uh, sort of three things that scientists thought made their communication more effective, the style, the substance, and the frequency. So when I talked about style, the, uh, the things that we heard from scientists was uh, making sure that the email or the letter was personalized. It wasn't just a form letter, but it actually addressed the policymaker, uh, talked about their specific district, um, that they also presented their information in a well-organized and concise manner. Uh, in terms of substance, again, making sure that the information is well-organized, but also that it's well-researched. There are citations and stories that the policymaker and their staff might be able to refer back to after that meeting or after they've read your letter and want to go back to it. And then addressing issues that are related to the things that the policymaker talks about and it cares about. And then finally, the frequency is also really important. So if it's just a one-off interaction where the scientist only talked to the policymaker once and then went their separate ways, that wasn't as effective as building a relationship over time, uh, following up after the meeting to say thank you, here are some questions you asked, here's some follow-up information. Things that you can do to really build that relationship over time are important. What was less effective, I think scientists uh, were frustrated by some of the things that Liz talked about earlier. So there's a politically polarized context around certain issues uh, and some policymakers maybe have a seeming lack of interest in some topics. Um, and then, although email was the most frequent way that people communicated with policymakers, they also said that was uh, much less effective than direct face-to-face -face interactions or phone calls. So that's what the scientists found effective, but how did that compare to what the members of Congress or at, at other levels uh, and their staff recommend? Yeah, and Liz, you should also chime in too since you did the interviews, but I think policymakers generally agreed with those tips about connecting to relevant issues, connecting to interests, and they also added it's important to uh, have the communication line up with particular policy windows, like when the issue might be coming up for a hearing or a vote. Uh, they also said keep your initial communication concise, easy to understand, and provide links and additional information uh, should the policymaker and their staff want to dig in a little bit more. And then finally, they noted the importance of being a constituent. So they're much more likely to meet with someone from their district uh, than someone who is outside of that district. And uh, they're really excited about building a relationship with those constituents. So uh, having more discussions over time. 
So I, I would I would add. I think that's that's exactly right. And um, I guess I would add. You know, one thing that really struck me about the survey was how frustrated scientists are with um, with policymakers. And um, you know, I, I sympathize with some of that frustration certainly. Um, but I wonder if some of the frustration is because scientists don't recognize how much um, how important it is to to make their communication relevant to basically what's going on. It, you know, in our case, we were looking at the U.S. Congress. You know, if you are doing some fascinating research on a subject that isn't anywhere near the policy uh, agenda, and you aren't able to talk about how you know your research connects to constituent interests or you know something um, that is really quite important to the nation as a whole. If you if you can't make that link, um, policymakers will seem disinterested. They genuinely will be disinterested, and so um, you know. I, I wonder if that's part of the disconnect. On the other hand, again, I, I, I do certainly sympathize um, that, um, you know, there are often, um, as I mentioned before, uh, influences on, on policymakers that are, are less than helpful. So let me ask a, a question, kind of a follow-up to the follow-up and uh, about reciprocity. And it's like we've been talking about a one-way uh, relationship here where the researchers and the scientists have a question or have something that they want to uh, hand to the policymakers. But what could trigger the policymakers to reach out to the scientists and initiate this uh, relationship? I think one of the things is having that relationship. So knowing that you have a scientist in your district that you can reach out to, maybe you've talked with them in the past, um, so sort of knowing who's in their stable of people that they might want to talk with. Um, many times policymakers will go to the people they already know. And then after that, they might start to reach out to the university in their district or other places. Um, but that relationship is really important. Yeah, I think that it, that's one thing that was incredibly important is, um, you know, you'll we'll probably emphasize this again. This idea of relationships. One thing that relationships do is is basically just get you on people's radar screen. And um, you know, members of Congress staff they often need they have informational needs that come up very quickly, and so they don't always have the time to do extensive research about who might be the you know best person out there to contact they'll turn to people they know they'll turn to people they know directly to ask a question or to you know ask um you know who is a person we could we could speak with on this on this topic so this is why relationships and networks of relationships um really are quite important if you want to be impactful so we have dueling Aaron. so i'm going to ask Aaron heath um, you work in government relations at AAAS and have a lot of experience interacting with scientists and with policymakers. But what are some of the biggest misconceptions that scientists have about members of Congress and congressional staff? Misconceptions. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you three that I've heard. Uh, the first misconception that I've heard is is my member of Congress doesn't want to hear from me. Uh, I, I would say uh, they absolutely do. It's, it's their job. It's their job to represent their constituents. And they really care about doing it well, and uh, they care about what you think. So it's uh, it's incredibly important to uh, to reach out to them. Uh, the second misconception I sometimes hear is um, my member of Congress doesn't agree with anything I think. It's useless. Um, I would say it's definitely not useless. It's really important for science to have a seat at the table. Uh, one expression that we hear a lot uh, around here is if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So uh, we really want to make sure science has a seat. Uh, I also believe that there is always a way to find common ground, um, even if it's just a very simple place to start, like we all care about the health of our families. Once you have that common ground and that starting point, you can build from there. And that goes back to what Liz and Emily were saying about building relationships. Um, the, the third misconception is kind of the flip side of that. It's, it's my member of Congress is such a strong supporter of science that there's there's really no reason to reach out. And I would say 
uh, it's always good to reach out. Let them know that you're noticing the good work that they're doing and the strong support. Let them know that it's appreciated and, and take the time to thank them. Just to, to flip that question again, as we did the last time, though, are there mis are there misperceptions or misconceptions that uh, uh, policymakers and, and members of Congress have about scientists? Um, I think that uh, that's a good question. Um, I think maybe it's important for every policymaker to know uh, that there are scientists in their district who are who, who who really care to reach out and communicate with them. Um, so that's, I don't know if it's a misconception, but that's something I would want every policymaker to, to know is to have a roster of scientists and engineers that they, they can call in their district when they have a question. So as I, I mentioned, we have dueling errands. So I want to go to the other Aaron, Aaron Nash. Um, you were the team member that was primarily responsible for combing through the research literature for what prior authors have recommended with respect to science communication with policymakers. Do your team's recommendations differ from the prior research on this topic? And um, how, if so, and why? Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so in terms of our recommended practices document, I think there's actually a lot of overlap or consilience with what other research and practitioners have already conveyed and I think that this is because when you're providing a set of recommended practices they have to be relevant to a wide variety of different people in different contexts and different scientific dis disciplines so you have to pitch those at a certain level so that they hold in all of those different contexts so you can't get too specific otherwise you're going to recommend um, things that are effective or ethical in one situation but but not another but I think our guidelines can be tailored by different people for those different contexts. Um, so one way that I think our recommended practices do differ in our research is we have tried to make the ethical considerations salient in ways that a lot of the prior research hasn't. So much of the existing literature places a lot of emphasis on effectiveness. Um, without thinking too much about ethical concerns and how these concerns might interact with the effectiveness goals. So you can imagine that some science communication practices might be really effective in the short term, um, perhaps you know, those that make use of our subconscious um, cognitive mechanisms, but uh, perhaps those same practices might uh, raise many ethical questions and even have a trade-off for longer-term effectiveness if using those strategies um, in some circumstances undermine trust. So um, I don't think we've yet asked enough questions about when different uh, communicative practices might be, be ethical. Um, so I think that we have a lot more, more work to do as a community there. But I also think that another way that our research and practices differ from from previous uh, research and guidelines um, is that we really have tried to make them very practical and connected to practice. So um, having the AAAS on board, um, I think was a real strength to uh, our research process. And um, it, I think it differs because a lot of academic and scholarly research is um, very theoretical and high level. So I think that that we have done um, a, a reasonable job of trying to connect up to connect the two worlds together, the scholarly world and the, the practical world. So let me bring up an audience question about a disconnect. And this is a question that I think is going to come up in various forms throughout, but I'm going to phrase it the way that uh, uh, has been phrased in the question here. If your research does not align with a media narrative that is untrue, how do you recommend approaching policymakers with well-researched empirical data? And I'm not sure who I'm, I'm uh, uh, focusing this question at, but whoever feels strongly, leap in. <laughs> Don't everybody speak at once. I mean, so I, mean, I guess I can I can start. Um, you know, one thing that we I don't think this made it into the guide, but um, Policymakers, they consume a lot of media, they consume a lot of political media, and so that actually is is powerful, and I think that's actually underrated in terms of um, 
kind of their uh, their knowledge on their background knowledge on different subjects. And so that can be really hard if your if your research is is counter that narrative. Um, so um, something else, though, I, I guess I I don't know exactly what's behind the the question, but something else that we've discussed in thinking about the ethics of of communication is that when one communicates. Ideally, one would communicate not only about one's own research, but also convey uh, the nature of, um, of of findings within the field. Okay, so the, I, what I'm trying to get to is if you are if you are not only counter the media narrative, but also your research is counter uh, other research in your field, um, we would argue that you should convey your research, and you can you know you know, obviously talk up uh, your research methods and findings, but you should also uh, communicate what others have found that may be contrary to you. But now if if the media narrative is truly contra a general consensus in your field, I mean, that is that is really important to convey. And um, this is part of the reason we think it's so important to have more scientists communicating with policymakers is, you know, you come with the research and it's well documented and, you know, I, this is something I guess we just believe we ought to be chipping away at uh, misconceptions that are out there. And in our experience, I mean, one interaction may not have a huge impact, but repeated interactions with, with very good quality research, um, uh, especially if it's connected to a policy agenda, will be impactful. Do others have fo things that they would add to that? I I think that that was a, a reasonable summa summary, Liz. Um, I think it's about um, trying to put everything into a context of the total evidence base and also um, thinking in advance about the reasons why somebody might buy into that that media narrative um, or wherever it's coming from and try to have um, your arguments ready for, for why you know you don't accept that version of um, a narrative. Um, so I think just doing a bit of preparation to anticipate those sorts of things would be valuable. Yeah, I think my concern um would be I go with all my data nicely uh, arrayed, and I say, here's my data, and the uh, policymaker comes back, yeah, you got your data, but I got my story or my anecdote, and my anecdote trumps your data. And I'm just wondering, what what do you do? So, um, you know, I, I a story was relayed to me by um, a scientist who, you know, had exactly this kind of interaction with a policymaker, and the policymaker had a really compelling story, you know, involving a family member, and um, and just didn't want to believe what what the scientist had to say. And uh, that said, you know, the, the scientist, you know, he he stuck to his guns and um, kept his cool, and uh, you know, continued with. Um, you know his his argument uh, backed by really ample evidence, many many studies, and at the end of the interaction, the scientist didn't feel very good about the communication. But actually, it turned out you know a month later he got a call back for another another meeting. And so this is this you know the, the chipping away, uh, you know keeping your cool, you know following the advice we've laid out. Um, you're not going to persuade everybody. There are certain people who are lost causes on certain topics, and um, you may decide you're not going to waste your time, but um, I don't believe most people are, are lost causes, even if they, in an initial meeting, have that kind of um, uh, reaction to your research. Liz, I think that's a really good point about the sort of conversation dialogue piece that is so important. Just being willing to answer questions, listen, be a part of a conversation rather than just sort of saying, here's all the data, let me dump it over and over and over again, but being willing to listen to what the questions are and consider those and ask questions of your own is such an important part of building trust and chipping away at some of those misconceptions. i to change the focus for just a moment. And um, uh, it's a question for to start with, Liz, and then we may go on from there. Uh, so this is a, a webinar that's sponsored by Social Science Space. And my question for you is, what do the best practices for science communication with policymakers differ 
depending on whether a person is a natural scientist or a social scientist? Yeah, so it's a really good question. I have to first start by um, giving a caveat that you know we didn't we didn't study this question specifically, uh, so you know this is somewhat speculative based on based on our in interactions, based on our reading. Um, you know, the first thing I'd say is I think that there's a ton of overlap between communication practices, whether you're a natural scientist or social scientist or some other person conveying, you know, technical advice. You you want to be clear. You don't want to use jargon. You want to be interesting and grab pe people's attention, have a good story, also have some data to back up the story. Uh, you want to be relevant to, to policymakers' goals. So there's a lot of similarity there. Um, there are these interesting differences. So on the one hand, uh, and this is kind of the good news, is that when you're a social scientist and you're interacting with policymakers, many of them actually have social science backgrounds. And so I think it can actually be easier for them to, to simply understand what you're conveying. It can be easier for them to relate. Um, on the other hand, um, we know that sometimes um, social, science, social scientists are given maybe a little bit less respect than natural science scientists. Um, if I'm a social scientist, so I, I say this, um, you know, very, very self-consciously, but, um, you know, there are, there's, there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, we know that there's less social science funding. And um, some of that may relate to the fact that it can be harder for social scientists to, um, to connect their research to common policymaker goals, um, economic growth, citizens health, national security, this sort of thing. We know there have been lots of debates over NSF and, and this kind of language. Um, so we say this recognizing that. Um, but you know, our advice would be to, to first make sure that, that policymakers understand the rigor of, of your research, that it is just as rigorous as a natural scientist research. Um, while it can sometimes be harder to come to a consensus in the social sciences, which is um, its own its own problem, if there is um, a, a decent consensus in a field, make sure that you relay that and and really work hard to again connect your research to um, to legislative agendas. And there are lots of ways to do that. Sometimes it's directly in terms of the effectiveness of policy. Um, and you know there may be other there may be other indirect linkages, um, and actually, if if my AAAS colleagues uh, don't mind, I'd I'd like to ask them if they have thoughts about because you guys have been around talking to both natural scientists and social science scientists for for a long time. Yeah, yeah just just briefly to underscore something you you, you said, I, I think social science touches so much of what policymakers care about. So. Uh, it, it, it's on the social scientists to think in advance about um, about how to convey the importance of their research and in particular why policymakers should care about it, why it's important to them. Mm -hmm. I think on that, there are so many issues that rely on both social science and physical science or natural science. So for me, I used to work in climate change research and climate change touches on a lot of physical science pieces. Why is the climate changing? what are humans doing to change the climate, but it also touches on a lot of social science pieces. How do we as a society respond? What are the impacts on our economy? What are the impacts on mental health? What are the impacts on society and sort of cohesion, social cohesion? So, so many issues that policymakers are thinking about really rely on information and conversations with scientists from across the spectrum. Um, can I just jump in for a minute? Uh, I, I just want to mention um, when it comes to natural science versus social science, I do think that um, social science scientists have um, an even greater obligation perhaps than natural scientists to consider the, the values that are influencing their science. Um, definitely, you know, in, in their science, but also in their background assumptions that can influence their first order claims. So um, I, I do think particularly in, in social sciences, when a consensus does form, we really do need to think about the ways in which um, there might be shared values that are not shared more broadly within the, the community. Um, 
that are informing and leading to that consensus forming. So um, it is really important that we scrutinize the formation of consensuses and make sure that they're forming for the right reasons um, to do with data and evidence um, and value judgments that a wide variety of people can, can share. Aaron, you, you, you kind of prefigured what I was going to ask next, and, and I was going to ask you to keep your uh, philosopher hat on because we don't have enough disciplines presented, so we need to bring another one in. I'd like to keep <laughs> that hat on. And I'm kind of interested in what makes for something you mentioned earlier, which was ethical science communication. And I mean, what does that mean beyond the obvious commitment scientists have to the truth? Yeah, okay. Um, it, it can mean many, many different things, and I'm not going to have time to talk about them all today. But um, I think it's really important that we remember when we talk about this topic that it is connected to larger debates about what the appropriate role of science is in policymaking and in a democratic society and, and what the role of experts are. But um, Coming back to the question, what does it mean beyond the obvious commitment scientists have to the truth? Well, uh, one reason why truth is not sufficient for ethical science communication is that it's possible to mislead other people by only telling them truths about the world. So I think a really nice illustration of this phenomenon is in Kaylin O'Connor and James um, Wetherill's new book, um, the misinformation age, how false beliefs spread. And they show us how policymakers can be misled when somebody communicates results very selectively. And so the studies themselves um, are genuine, good studies, good research that communicate the results truthfully and accurately. Um, but the studies, you know, represent one corner of the literature or those scientists might have got a bunch of insignificant results and just put those results in a filing drawer and not included it as part of the evidence that they're conveying to uh, a policymaker. So um, it's the total body of evidence um, that policymakers uh, are exposed to that matters and that can be distorted by even just people being honest and, tell it, and telling the truth um, or at least um, displaying a type of honesty. So I think that it's important that the information is complete as, as well as being accurate and that points of disagreement within the literature and the community are highlighted and uncertainties acknowledged. Um, and another thing is when you're communicating your first order claims to policymakers, it's also important that you give them um, higher order evidence about those uh, claims, how they were formed, what methods were used, who agrees with you, who doesn't agree with you, and how widespread that agreement and disagreement is um, throughout the community, etc. So when you're communicating that higher order evidence, um, it's important that, that you also present that accurately and, and completely as well. Um, so there are a bunch of, of different ethical considerations we could talk about um, and maybe readers, uh, like listeners, might have particular uh, concerns that, that they want to talk about. But um, two additional ones we can quickly mention is that I think that there, there can be a temptation to speak beyond the boundaries of your expertise. Um, so if you don't know the answer to a question, it is okay to say that you don't know and perhaps to point them towards colleagues or other parts of the um, community that might be better place to answer those questions um, and you know of course in certain contexts we're all free to speak our minds about various policy issues as citizens but it's important that you distinguish between when you're communicating as an expert and when you're communicating as a citizen but um, you know we should also think about how uh, sometimes people might not be able to tell when we have one hat or the other or if we're in a conversation and we're constantly switching hats. It might come to be a bit murky um, as to whether our audience member is following when we're putting different hats on and off. And so they might be taking us to be making claims as an expert when actually we're making them as a citizen. And so I, I think that's really important for scientists to keep in mind. Um, and of course, uh, there's the obvious sorts of ethical concerns like disclosing conflicts of interests. 
but if there's no uh, formal or obvious conflicts of interest, like I was saying, um, scientists should reflect on the ways in which um, various types of values have entered into their science. And it's legitimate for, for values to enter into science in various ways, but um, it's really important, uh, particularly when you're communicating with policymakers, I think that scientists um, really reflect on how social and moral and political values have influenced their work, work, uh, work so that they can uh, highlight those to policymakers. And Kevin Elliott, a philosopher, calls this backtracking. And so you're showing the policymaker where you've used values at different decision points. And so a policymaker can uh, you know, see how perhaps if you had different values, you might come up with a different conclusion. Um, so I think that's one thing to keep in mind. And philosophers have done, you know, some great work on, on values in science. So I'd point to the work of Heather Douglas um, and Kevin Elliott in particular, who both have books uh, relevant to policymakers on this topic and scientists communicating with policymakers. I just wanted to say when we post this on social science space, when uh, the archive version, we will link to uh, some of the resources that, that Aaron has, has brought up. Just to, to make sure for those that didn't catch them the first time around. Um, I want to get a little bit into the weeds, if you will, on, on, on some of the, the process of, of communicating with policymakers. And for that, I'm, I'm, I want to go to um, Aaron Heath. The final portion of the recommended practices guide focuses on the ins and outs of the U.S. government. And by the way, I do want to ask later on about the U.S. versus the rest of the world, but we'll, we'll table that for the moment. Uh, but there are various practicalities any person hoping to influence the, the federal government needs to know. So frankly, getting up to speed on congressional schedules and current legislation and uh, Thomas and et cetera, et cetera, is daunting. And we all have day jobs. Uh, nobody's desperately hunting for yet another uh, vocation. So what is your advice beyond the booklet for quickly getting up to speed on the basics of Congress or uh, any other policy making body? That's a great question. I would throw out a few thoughts on this. The first is to get in touch with your government relations office. So many, in, many research institutions and organizations have offices that, that, that deal with government relations. And I would recommend you reach out to them and get to know them. They are wonderful resources uh, in terms of learning about the issues of the day in science policy, but also about ways to engage in policy on the federal level, but also on the state and local level, uh, where a lot can be accomplished. Uh, another thing that I, I often recommend is it's reaching out to your scientific society, and not just because I, we work for one. Uh, but there are many scientific societies out there that have policy offices, and they they track the issues. They have websites with all sorts of resources. They often will have policy newsletters, uh, and I will uh, name drop our, our own policy newsletter. It's called the Policy Alert, which if you're a AAAS member, you can sign up and get every week, and it talks about issues and also uh, engagement opportunities. Uh, many societies have action alerts as well that you can you can opt in and you can receive an alert by email or even text or Twitter uh, suggesting a policy issue you can act on right that moment and how you might act on it. Uh, and, and many societies also, also offer wonderful training opportunities. AAAS has several in policy and communications. Uh, and a lot of these training opportunities the societies offer uh, incorporate some kind of engagement opportunity as well. So you'll get a train, but you also might get, for example, a congressional visit day where you come to Washington and you meet with your member of Congress and their staff. So those are fantastic opportunities. The last thing I'll say is there are networks out there that you can you can engage with. There's If you're a student, there's something called the National Science Policy Network, which is a collection of student science policy groups all around the country. Uh, there's also a, a coalition that I co-chair called Engage in Engaging Scientists and Engineers in Policy Coalition. The website is science-engage.org. And on the website, you'll find, I'll find all sorts of resources on how to engage in policy, as well as webinars and networking opportunities. So those are some suggestions I would have to quickly get up to speed and get involved. So is there a different approach you get you use when discussing science with a government agency whose people may be 
expert in some of these issues already, rather than a government representative. Uh, in terms of, oh, sorry. Go ahead, engaging with federal agencies. Yeah, I mean, how does how does that differ? What are what are are there different tools, or are these recommendations are they going to work regardless if it if they're a government employee if they get a government paycheck they're good we're good to go, or does it differ if they're a, a an agency person um, or a staffer or a, a a member or are there are there different different strokes for different folks? Yeah, so context is is, is certainly everything. Um, you can't lobby if you work. For, you can't lobby on behalf of a federal agency if you work for a federal agency. Um, you can certainly engage in policy as a citizen, but it's really important to know the rules of the road for whatever organization you work for, um, whether public or private. Um, in terms of how to engage with federal agencies, federal agencies are often uh, requesting input on, uh, on implementing certain policies. They ask for uh, information from stakeholders. They ask for uh, they sometimes put out questions that they would love for scientists and engineers to answer. Uh, and those opportunities are, are constant and not always well known. So that's uh, another thing that often, if you subscribe to a, a newsletter or some kind of action alert with the Scientific Society, for example, they will often try to highlight those opportunities where you can actually uh, in, advise a federal agency on how to uh, implement a certain policy. So. Um, yeah, I would I would add here um, that um, that focusing on talking with people working in agencies is actually um, an underrated uh, way of influencing policy. So in the U.S., these are folks that have a tremendous influence in terms of uh, in terms of translating you know policy created by Congress into rules that are then implemented. So um, you can have a lot of influence over policy actually by interacting with um, people who work federal federal agencies, state agencies, et cetera. Um, a couple things I'd add is that these individuals actually are different in a couple of different ways. They are, um, I, I think, tell folks on the call here, tell me if you, if you disagree, but I, I think that they are, they're often more likely to have more technical knowledge about um, a particular area, so less likely to be gener generalists than an elected representative. So that changes the way you would, you know, interact with them. Um, and, you know, this is maybe obvious, but they tend to be less motivated by political concerns. Um, in some ways that may be refreshing for our scientists communicators i think you can get into the weeds much more and and not have to worry so much about um you know political incentives and etc um, one other thing i forgot to mention that i should have is uh, federal advisory committees so federal agencies often have advisory committees that benefit from uh, scientists and engineers being members and providing their expertise Uh, I had promised we'd ask this, so I'm going to ask it at this point. So the the, the recommended guide seems like it works like a, a well in the U.S. What about outside the U.S.? Are are the recommendations well in general? Would you say that they are, they are going to work pretty much anywhere? I mean, obviously there'll be certain differences, but I mean, will they work well? We have a we have a number of people, for example, from Colombia that are in on this call today. So I'm just wondering. If, can I take this information and, and in general apply it generally, or is it too US centric? So I'll, I'll give a start to this. It's a, it's a tricky, tricky question because we did focus so much on the US context. Um, I think that, that much of our, our uh, recommendations apply, um, especially the earlier portions. I think whenever you are um, trying to influence policymakers, you know, you are normally going to have to create communication that is pitched toward more of a generalist audience. Um, you know, with some exceptions, obviously, you have to be relevant. Um, much of the re much, much of it applies as you get into later parts of the booklet, where we talk about the practicalities, obviously, of, of the U.S. government. There'll be some differences there, um, and there there are. There's lots of variation around the world. Um, you know, there are certain systems like in the UK where um, more policy is being created outside of um, the elected bodies. Uh, so, and I, I have to admit, I don't 
know too much about uh, the governmental structures in Colombia. So those kinds of things affect what types of people you would approach with what information. Um, and there are also different institutional differences across countries in terms of um, how well they have developed different bodies for translating um, scientific knowledge within government. So that also is going to matter quite a bit in terms of, again, who you approach and um, the knowledge level of the people that you're interacting with. Um, and, and then once we get into ethics, that, that's more, you know, Aaron Nash's domain. Um, there are lots of considerations to take into account there. Um, and I, I, at this point, I, I, I'd like to throw it out to my colleagues if people have other things they'd like to add there. I think some of the really basic things like knowing who your audience is and really making sure that you're making those connections, identify who within that space is going to have the leverage that you're hoping to connect to on policy. Um, those sorts of things, understanding, thinking about your own goals for interacting, what goals that policymaker might have, those are more, much more universal. Um, so those sorts of foundations of how to connect with and communicate with policymakers, I think apply fairly broadly. Yeah, I would, I'd echo all of that from my colleagues. Um, I think it's just a really important question to keep in mind. And uh, I think that people should definitely reflect on which parts of the, the guidelines um, might not be relevant to their jurisdiction or might need some sort of modification or tailoring. Uh, one thing that I think is a really interesting question is, um, you know, when people from uh, who are based in the US or the UK or Australia provide scientific advice um, to governments in, in other, other parts of the world. I think that is, that is a question we haven't dealt with in this study, but uh, it's a fascinating and, and very fraught um, question. But what I would say is that it's important for scientists to distinguish between those different contexts as well when they're giving advice to um, a government that they're a citizen of versus other governments. Um, the ethical issues, I think, become even trickier if you think about the ways that even within our own jurisdictions, there is reasonable disagreement as to um, what one should do, morally speaking, within different situations. Well, when you get into um, relationships with, with other countries, when, when you're a citizen of one uh, nation and you're advising another, that's, that's a whole different um, story, I think, that we didn't, we didn't look at in, in our studies or our guidelines. One other thing that I wanted to point out is when we asked the scientists, were they engaging, we found more than half of them were doing some sort of policy engagement. So I think for, for scientists in other countries, ask your colleagues, what have they done? What's worked for them? What hasn't worked for them? Uh, that colleague relationship is really useful and people like to share what's worked and what hasn't worked. So that's also a really good place to start. So I, I, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but I have a, a kind of a, a, a processy question. And as, as a journalist, one of the questions we're always supposed to answer is, why am I telling you this now? So scientists are often advised to have an ask as part of their email or their in-person uh, in -person meeting with the policymaker. So does that ask always have to be related to a specific bill or uh, that's on the floor right then or a specific vote that's coming up? Absolutely not. Uh, certainly before a bill comes to a vote, there are things that the policymakers might do. They might co-sponsor the legislation, they might offer an amendment, they might ask to include certain report language in that particular bill, but they might also comment on proposed regulations at an agency, they might write a, write a letter to the agency head, or they might ask for briefings from agency staff about a particular issue. So just this week we saw Senator Cantwell from Washington asked for the Consumer Product Safety Commission to provide a briefing on elevator safety after she saw a story about children that had been injured or killed in home elevators. Uh, they might organize a briefing for other staff members, uh, request a hearing about a particular issue, or ask questions of a witness at a hearing. 
Uh, they might join a sign-on letter about a particular topic. They might join a caucus with other policymakers, like the Congressional R&D Caucus. Um, they might also give a speech on the floor of the House or give a speech at an event that you are hosting. Uh, they might issue a press release um, or they might uh, actually come to where you are. We had uh, Congresswoman Haley Stevens actually give some opening remarks at the launch event when we uh, launched our guide in January. Well, I feel we've, we've kind of, we've looped back to the idea of where we started, which is it's the important thing is to create networks. And, and uh, I, I would argue to create them in advance and, and not just when uh, desperation is knocking at the door. Uh, but so speaking of desperation knocking at the door, uh, the clock is knocking at mine right now. So that's about all the time we have for today. And I want to thank all the, the audience members who joined us, but I want to give a special thank you to our guests, um, Liz, Aaron, Emily, and especially um, Aaron Nash, from who got up extra early to join <laughs> us today. So in the coming weeks, be on the lookout for an email that includes um, uh, uh, a link to the entire webinar, and we'll also have a uh, link to some of the resources that were mentioned there, and uh, uh, and of course to the um, uh, to the uh, re the report and and the um, uh, its web companion that are on the uh, America edu site so again thank you all very much and good day thank you thank you bye bye